Welcome to episode 112 of the Sports Geek Podcast. This week I catch up with Micah Hart about his career in the NBA and at the Atlanta Hawks. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host who's looking for the next design of at Sports Geek Shoes. Yes, his shoes have a Twitter account, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, I am looking for my next design of the Sports Geek Shoes. You can follow my shoes on Twitter at Sports Geek Shoes. Got six pairs so far, not, and they're, they're all Adidas uh, or Adidas for those of you listening in the US. Um, I potentially might go across to, to Nike. I have had uh, former guest Dan Harbison, who now works at Nike, needling me about getting a pair of Nikes. Uh, so they may be Nikes. So please send in your suggestions on colours, colour schemes, uh, what they should have on them. The only rule is, has to say Sports Geek, so I can claim the shoes with my tax. Uh, my name is Sean Callanan. You're listening to the Sports Geek podcast. You're either doing that on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or my favourite podcast app, Pocket Casts, or you're listening to it at the Sports Geek website, sportsgeekhq.com. You can contact me either via Twitter, at Sean Callanan, at Sports Geek, or old-fashioned way, Sean at sportsgeekhq.com. Or even better, send me a snap review. Sean Callanan is my Snapchat handle. Send me a snap review Uh, As you're listening to it or after you're listening to it, I really do appreciate all the feedback that I am getting on the Snapchat right now. Um, This week's guest is Micah Hart, who has for for a long time been working in Atlanta, both with uh, NBA Digital and more recently with the Atlanta Hawks, getting a lot of kudos for the work that the Atlanta Hawks did over the past 12 to 18 months uh, post-rebrand and really riding that wave of that really great season they had. Um, so a chat with Micah around, I guess, his history working in the NBA digital family um, as well as what it's like driving driving digital for, for a team on the rise um, and how it was different when that team was not on the rise and his, his background in digital overall as, a, as both a content producer um, on the NBA side, um, one of the early podcasters, uh, setting up uh, the uh, bog, uh, the podcast uh, for the for the hang time hang time guys with Seku Smith, one of the podcasts I still listen to as an NBA fan, um, and then t- chat to him about uh, the world of NBA Twitter and gifts and uh, the the competitive nature of of NBA teams going backwards and forwards with a bit of banter and a bit of fun gifts that they're, that they're having in the NBA world. So I hope you really enjoy my chat uh, with Micah on his career in. Uh, in the NBA, and uh, and you might hear about what he wants to look t- to do uh, going forward. So enjoy my chat with Micah Hart, formerly from the NBA and Atlanta Hawks. Very happy to welcome Micah Hart, former director of interactive marketing at the Atlanta Hawks. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast. Thanks for having me, Sean. So I wanted to catch up with you. Um, you finished up at the Atlanta Hawks uh, recently. Um, I want to talk to you about a little bit about your role at, uh, at the Hawks and also your background. You're, you've been in Atlanta uh, for a long time now and, and bounced around with a few jobs. You want to give us a bit of background on your career in, in sports digital? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've, uh, I've been part of the NBA family for really most of my professional career. I came to Atlanta, I guess it was 2004, uh, and uh, started working on the websites for the the Hawks and and for the Thrashers. We had a we had a hockey team at the time, the dearly departed Thrashers, and uh, did that for about six years. And then moved over to NBA when uh, Turner bought the rights to NBA Digital. Worked with them for a few years on the editorial side. Um, actually started the NBA's podcast. So I've been a, I've been a long time fan of the podcast game. Yeah, yeah. So you were you were it was part of the the hang time. Uh, yeah, the hang time blog and the podcast involved with that, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Seku and I, uh, Seku Smith um, and I go way back. He actually was the high school sports beat writer in Jackson, Mississippi when I was in high school and I grew up in Jackson. And so he and I just randomly followed each other from city to city 
Uh, so it was a lot of fun uh, starting that with him. And we both started over there around the same time. And we're both like, we got, you know, NBA needs a podcast. We got to get one going. Uh, I mean, at least an official podcast. Um, and so uh, we brought, brought Lang Whitaker on and, uh, and had a lot of fun with that. And, and they're still doing a great job with it now. Um, and then I uh, came back uh, to the Hawks about, uh, about three, three and a half seasons ago now, um, sort of in the same role that I was in. Uh, but now instead of getting to do all the fun stuff, like going to practice and, uh, and traveling with the team and doing all the good stuff, I was now, uh, you know, giving direction to the people that got to do the fun stuff. Now you make, you don't make it sound, ex- you don't make it sound exciting. I was delegating the, uh, the fun <laughs> stuff. Um, so, so coming back to the Hawks sort of that, for that second, second trip, it's not exactly the same as LeBron coming home, but you've come back to the Hawks and the, in, in that space, they were, they were going through that brand refresh and, and trying to revitalize the brand. What were, what were some of the things that you were doing from a, from a content point of view to really, to, to really step up the game? Because that's what it was really about, about, hey, Atlanta, we're back, we're bold, we brought, bringing back the, 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 the Pac-Man logo, which, which the Atlanta uh, locals love. What were some of the things that you looked to do from a digital point of view to also step up the game? Yeah, um, you know, Atlanta is a, is a transient community, and there are lots of other cities that are like that, and you'll often hear people talk about Atlanta being a, a bad sports town. Uh, I don't know that that I, that I agree with that. I just think there's not a lot of natives, uh, and the natives have just not seen a lot of success, especially on the basketball side. And so what we were dealing with was apathy. Um, and we talked about this a lot, that apathy is the worst thing you can have, because at least if they hated you, that would be an emotion. Um, but people just didn't care. And so we really felt like, from the digital side of things, that was our front lines of the battle to, to get people to care about it. Um, and, you know, that's the most intimate relationship that we can, we can create with people. We can interact with them individually, all the stuff, you know, that people who listen to this podcast know about. So we really wanted our voice and our brand in digital to be something that made people, you know, sort of sit up and take notice. Uh, you know, we, we can't control the performance of the team so we wanted to be, you know, entertaining uh, in our own right, regardless of how the team was performing. Um, and, and I think a lot of that really started with authenticity. Um, and that's something that I think with, with the brand refresh and everything, we really wanted to bring just a new, a new way of looking at things and not just doing things the, the way they've always been done, um, but not for no reason either. Uh, not to just throw things up and see what works, but to really be uh, strategic with, how we how we approach you know sort of creating this new persona that we're not the same old hawks that you're used to, um, and I really think that the digital space was the sort of the the catalyst for all the change that came after it, um, and certainly the team really deserves the lion's share credit for everything that happened because without them playing the way they did, I mean, not, nothing would have changed uh, or not much would have changed. I like to think we were, were doing a good job, but. Uh, the gasoline on the fire was definitely the team's performance. Um, so it really just a lot of things happening uh, all at the same time are very fortuitous. I mean, and that's the thing. You do hear of teams wanting sort of change direction, change momentum or, or you know, really shake up their fan base. And, you know, that getting them out of apathy is a you know really strong point. And that's where digital, from an engagement point of view, you can be on the very front line. By by you know favoriting a tweet and amplifying fan voice and and really getting in the trenches and it's a lot of work it's a lot of work on the thumbs to to go and do that but there's this sometimes there's this resistance for hey we're going to go and do this because we've never done it but fans embrace it once you start once they will notice the the change in direction on digital as soon as you do it if you're if you're saying we're going to be out there we're going to engage we're going to we're going to talk with our fans we're going to encourage our biggest cheer squad um you know it's something that you can change really quickly i totally agree uh and we did see immediate results um and and, you know you know you mentioned like engaging and favoriting a tweet or retweeting somebody I, i don't think people really understand i mean you sort of laugh it off like oh what's the big deal about doing something like that but when you have a you know a brand as big as, as a pro, pro team or you know something you know large 
restaurant chain, I don't know, movie, what have you, people love to feel a part of something, uh, and especially something that's sort of perceived as, you know, being big time. And we would, I mean, it just doesn't even, t- I mean, you're right, it does take a lot of time and effort to do that stuff, but with one click of a button, you know, you're essentially making somebody's day and, and making them, you know, that much more excited about, about the team and the brand. And again, I know that sort of sounds corny, but I saw it firsthand with people's reactions to it, you know, sending out like, oh my God, I can't believe the Hawks retweeted me or favored my tweet. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, so it really makes a difference. And over time, that stuff just builds and builds on itself. And, you know, they're sharing your message to their friends uh, and building that word of mouth. And, and it definitely made a, a huge difference for us. And I think something, uh, like if you haven't read uh, Kevin Kelly's 1,000 True Fans, um, it's a it's a wide article from many years ago, but it, it pretty much says if your brand can get 1,000 True Fans, then, you know, they are going to be advocates uh, for everything that, that you do. And sometimes as a pro team with the, with the big numbers that you might have following, you can sort of forget that. But what you can what you can do is get those one thousand true fans in all the different segments you're looking for. So it might be you know local fans in the region that are under twenty because you want to make sure you're hitting that market. If you can get a thousand people in that in that section in that segment, then they will reach that market for you. And the same goes for out of market fans or fans watching from home. And so if you sort of take that one thousand true fans and apply to the four real key segments for you and start getting that engagement and start locking them in because you do you, you lock them in when you favorite their their you know you double tap on their instagram photo the amount of times that i've seen photos coming through of screenshots of of people taking screenshots of the fact that you know the atlanta hawks favorited my picture and now they've shared it you've reinforced they will make sure that they follow your hashtags use your hashtags take a photo every time they go to the game and that just multiplies because more, you know more of their friends will see it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and you know, it, it's interesting because we we did grow uh, a lot over my time, uh, you know, with the Hawks in terms of our social media following. But it was never, to me at least, our most important goal. Growth is great, but I wanted the right people following us. I didn't want to just have a million Facebook fans just to say we could have a million Facebook fans because it's 600,000 of them don't care about you, but they just liked it because you ran a campaign saying, you know, hey, you could win this if you like us. Like, I wanted people who actually cared about us. And I'd rather have 10,000 fans who are truly engaged, you know, than 100,000 fans who, who really don't pay attention to anything that you're doing. And maybe that only matters, you know, from an algorithm standpoint, I guess, with Facebook right now. But, uh, you know, Twitter may evolve. Snapchat, any of those different platforms could evolve into a different space. You just want people who, who truly care because they're the ones they're going to advocate for. Well, and exactly, and it, and it is a platform-by-platform platform case. Like, you know, the, the NBA Twitter, as it's known, um, gets a lot of publicity uh, for what, what happens between teams and things like that. So the reason people are following, you know, ATL Hawks on Twitter is an entertainment option because they want to see the banter between you know, the Warriors and, and the Hawks when that game is happening because that's what you're providing. But just because I'm following the account doesn't mean I'm, you know, I'm an Atlanta Hawks fan. It just means I'm following from entertainment reasons. So that's where, you know, you've got to take each platform differently and say, well, how can I deeper engage our fans? How can I make sure that I'm still delivering for them? Yes, the entertainment side of it is great because it's great for growth and things like that, but I want to always be making sure that it uh, it's exactly hits the exact mark for, for my fans. I, I totally agree. Um, and that's and that's what we really tried to build our social for is for the fans. Um, you know, I, I used to say when I when I came back to the Hawks and we were kind of starting, uh, you know, really from scratch uh, in the social space. Like I wanted our digital platforms to sort of be the 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 voice of the Hawks fans. So when the Hawks were doing great, we were going to celebrate it. And when the Hawks were struggling, we weren't going to pretend that it wasn't happening. Uh, you know, you don't have to be, you know, certainly not going to be negative about the team, um, but uh, it's not realistic to think that everything is going to go well all the time. And I'd rather have authentic engagement and show, like, real emotion because that's how the fans are. 
Um, and, you know, and especially, you know, we, you know, we've talked a lot with the Hawks about going after the millennial age, uh, you know, fan base, um, and the younger fans. And that's especially important in Atlanta because again, the older fans have already staked their claim for their teams. I'm the perfect example of this. I live in Atlanta, but I'm from Mississippi. I'm a Saints fan and the Falcons will never convert me. I mean, it's just never going to happen. They might get my kids. I hope they won't, but <laughs> they've got a much better chance uh, of, of getting my kids on board. Um, and so, you know, using social the way – I feel like an old person saying this, but using it the way the kids to use it uh, to me is the path to success because that's really who, especially for us, we really need to be cultivating because, you know, it's a long-term play and not every – organization is about the long term. Um, and, and there are short term things that you have to absolutely keep in mind as well, but long term forward facing, we had to be building those relationships that may not pay off from a money's you know, from a dollars and cents standpoint for a long time, but eventually will be very lucrative. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, developing that tone and the theme of, you know, what your social accounts are going to do. And I, I love, you know, when people say, how should we do it? And I said, you should be like a fan. You don't want to be talking down to them. You want to be in the bleachers, you know, sitting with the fans. I think that the, the point you made around if it's, you know, you want the team Twitter account to be bummed if it's a massive loss. You want to be hurting because the, the fans are hurting. And almost you want to be helping them grieve through that, through, through that, through that loss because they'll be back and up about for the next game. And you want to ride that roller coaster with them. Was there anything in particular that you sort of did to get your team to say, "This is how we're gonna. This is how we're gonna talk. This is the language we're gonna use. Uh, this is how we're gonna react to certain things." What What was the process behind behind that for for uh, for the for the Twitter account? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of it was was really just in the trenches. Myself and and Jared Wilson, uh, Jared Wilson, who. Uh, really is, you know, the hero behind our, you know, our Twitter feed in particular. I mean, he's running the day to day, uh, but he and I collaborated a lot and I, I brought him on, uh, specifically when I started, I was, you know, I, when I came back to the Hawks, I asked for a social media coordinator because I knew there was too much in the space to not have somebody dedicated to it. Um, and I know different teams have different philosophies about that. Um, but we were pretty small staff as it was. And I really saw social as, our entry point into, you know, again, changing the the conversation about who we were as a brand. Um, so a lot of it was just me and Jared, uh, you know, just kind of talking through, like, what did we want to do? I had a very specific uh, voice in mind, um, and he totally got what I was going for and executed on it brilliantly. Um, we did, over the course of time, actually sit down and kind of develop, uh, you know, sort of a brand persona, and we talked through, like, you know, who, what are the characteristics of this voice? Uh, who are they like? Um, what are some of the, how, how would they talk about certain things? How would we not talk about certain things? Um, and I think just doing that, you know, even just doing that as an exercise for ourselves helped us kind of think through, like, how do we want this to behave? Um, but it also was for internal use as well to kind of try to get people within the organization to understand what we were doing. Um, and you know, it was, it, it was, uh, it was difficult at times because the basketball side of the Hawks is very much the Spurs model of, you know, they're, they're, they're hardworking, uh, grind it out, keep your head down, don't make waves. Um, and that makes total sense for them. Uh, and they've had a lot of success and coach Bud and the staff in Atlanta have had amazing success. Um, but there's room for both. Uh, so how do we explain to, you know, the people within the organization, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and you know, and this is how we're going to go about doing it. And I think that that helps, you know, ease a lot of people's minds about how we're going about what we're doing. Yeah, I do think, um, sort of working through those scenarios and, and saying, well, if this happens, we'll do this and, and planning for that. I mean, a lot of the best tweets that you see, people go oh wow that's awesome well you know sort of looks you want it to look as spontaneous as possible but the best ones most likely aren't like you're saying if this happens and this might be a game situation that happens this is what we plan to do and so someone like Jared can just have that ready to go when that scenario happens and I think 
you know, it's it's sort of like, you know, visualization, the stuff that a lot of the athletes will do of when I hit the corner, I'm going to take that shot. I visualize that's how it's going to happen. You've got to do that sort of same thing um, you know, on, on your social, especially around around Twitter and developing something like we develop a, you know, a conversation guide. So then you can explain it to, to someone that says, why are we doing this? How are we doing it? Um, so they've, they've got some idea of, oh, we understand uh, what's going to happen. And yeah, uh, we've definitely dealt with the with the, the coaching department that doesn't want to see your tweet go up as uh, bulletin board material for the opposition coach. So sure. it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fine line of seeing where, where you can go with that. It, it definitely is. Um, and, and I'm not going to say we were perfect uh, by, by no stretch of imagination. I mean, we definitely uh, had instances where, where we did things that, that people didn't love um, externally or internally. Um, and, you know, some of that you just have to take, it comes with the territory. I mean, social is such a new space and it, it doesn't feel like it. It feels now like we've been doing it forever. Uh, but you know, it's like, it's only still been six, seven, eight years, what have you. I mean, that's no time. Uh, and people fear what they don't understand. And there are so many people that don't understand the digital space. Um, and especially from a, you know, and, and this is something that I believe very strongly that teams are their own media brands. Uh, they don't really need anybody else to tell their story anymore. Um, and this is a battle that I, you know, fought for a long time with the Hawks, and, and I would still fight it. Uh, you know, the the paper in Atlanta has like fifteen thousand Twitter followers for their sports account, and the Hawks have four hundred thousand. So who's got a bigger microphone? Uh, but there is a media landscape that is, you know, law, has been established for a long time, and that is what people are used to. And it's it's not normal to think about. Hey, instead of giving this scoop to the beat writer, why don't we put it out on our own channel? And I think most teams still fight that battle, but I don't think it will be for much longer. I think teams more and more are realizing like we not only can we monetize these ourselves by telling people to come here, um, but it also allows us to control our own narrative, uh, which I think is, is critically important for brands in any spectrum, sports or otherwise. Yep. Um, and that's the, I mean, that's the thing. We've been talking a little, you know, I'm talking obviously about social and, and, and defining voice in this short form, you know, in Twitter and things like that. A, uh, a lot of the stuff that you were doing at the Hawks and previously at the NBA was also, was also longer form uh, content. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing a trend uh, a little bit with Grantland, you know, rest in peace. Um and and other and, and other sites that are perform, providing this you know long form type of content. Um, you wrote a, an oral history of the Dominique Bur- uh, Dominique Wilkins Larry Bird uh, battles. Um, how how did you find I guess the mix of producing that longer form longer form content to this you know short sharp uh, you know short attention span millennials uh, type content to hey here's something deeper dive. Did you did you find that the fans had an appetite for both types of content? Absolutely, uh, and honestly, I, I really believe that good content is good content. Uh, people will spend more time on something if it if it proves to be worth their time. Uh, I don't think you have to make the assumption that no one's attention span is longer than ninety seconds. Um, it might only be ninety seconds if you only provide them ninety seconds worth of entertainment. If you put out a 10 minute piece, it better be 10 minutes worth of entertainment. Uh, that was definitely a labor of love for me. Uh, I grew up a Hawks fan and Dominique was my hero growing up. Um, it was probably foolish of me to undertake, uh, that oral history given all the stuff that we had going on. Um, but it was worth it because it was such a, I mean, if you're a basketball fan, I mean, the game seven, the 98 series between Celtics and Hawks is one of the all time great moments in NBA history and sort of just telling that story. If you're a Hawks fan, that's the seminal moment in franchise history. I, I hope someday it won't be, uh, but it, but it certainly is for now. Um, and, uh, and I think we got a lot of great content out of that and, you know, we produce a lot of stuff and this was back, you know, again, when the team was still pretty irrelevant, uh, but that got national attention. They got picked up by, most of the major publications, you know, internet publications, 
so to me, it showed that like, again, to the point of you can be your own media uh, network and, and content provider. We've never really done anything like that previously, something that you would expect to see at a Grantland or something like that. And I think teams um, have really started to move more towards doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, I still think it all comes down to the execution. Um, and I, because I wrote it, I think I'm probably too close to say whether we executed it well enough or not. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's right in the sweet spot for a Hawks fan talking about, you know, game seven from 88. Uh, and that's the thing, I, you know, I think I saw Ev Williams, uh, CEO of Medium, um, saying one of their metrics is is time on site and because, you know, it is about reading. And the fact that they're just their, their UX says, this is a seven-minute article. Um, and so, you know, oh, I've got to commit seven minutes to, to, to read this. Um, but it's it's only good if the quality is there, you know. Don't just listen to this podcast and go, oh, cool, we need to do a 10,000-word article because our fans will engage with it. They'll only engage with it if it's a good 10,000-word article. If it's just exactly if you're just right. padding to ten thousand, that's that's not going to work. So it is a it is a harder, much harder piece to do. Whether it's you know getting in, uh, you know if you're lucky enough to have someone with journalistic chops to be able to do that, then that's great internally. But you know also seeing success, um, and you're seeing a lot more journalism uh, or ex ex uh, writers that have been in the in the traditional space moving into the team side to write these longer form deeper dive content pieces because like you said before the, the the bigger microphone is with the team so it's better to have those you know fe- feature writers that previously have been on 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 mastheads traditional mastheads more and more of those are moving into into the team side you know look at uh, you know renowned chicago writer sam smith now writes for for bulls.com so i think more and more of that it still needs to be the quality uh, bar needs to be set really high it, it absolutely does um and, and you know on the one hand i would say you, you got to try things you can't be afraid to try something different um and if it's not successful then hopefully you, you learn from it uh and and try something different but I think the main thing to me is, again, getting to how important it is the quality be there is, and, and, and this is really something we felt like with our, with our Twitter feed as well. Uh, I know some teams choose not to share content that's not produced internally. Um, that was not our way of doing things because again, my point of view being, I want us to be sort of the, the, the first place you go for Hawk stuff if there's a great Hawks article and you're a Hawks fan, you're going to want to read it. And whether that was written by us or on Bleacher Report or, you know, some random dude's blog, if it's good enough to read, we want to share it. But there comes with that to me sort of an implicit contract, which is if we're sharing it, then we are telling you it's got our stamp of approval. This is worth your time. And if you start sharing things that aren't up to snuff, then you're eroding that, that contract. And so the one caution I would have is, you know, if you're going to commit to a 10,000 word piece, like you do have to commit to making it right. Because if it's not right and you tell, and you put a lot of, you know, effort behind it to promote it and whatnot, and it, and people don't like it, the next time you try to do it, they're going to remember that. And they're going to say, well, I, I read the last one and it really wasn't that good. I'm not going to bother with this. One. And people you know, their attention spans are short uh, and, and they don't have a lot of time to, you know, make judgments on, on your abilities. Uh, and if they remember something one way or the other, it's going to Im- impact their decisions in the future. Yeah, I really do like that idea that, you know, again, because you are setting up your own media company, it goes counter to that to say, we're going to share something from someone else's media company. And so that's, that's why people don't share that. But like you said before, you want to be the hub. You want to be everything everything that's there. Um, and, yes, you're not going to go and share an expose that po- posts your team in a negative light or something like that, but you might do it and exactly. give, your point, give your point of view or, or that kind of stuff or have, be able to have your counter on your site. But, if, again, if, there is a, if there's a great fan blog or a terrific feature article or, or, or you know, one of your players appears on, on this show or whatever it is, you want to make sure your fans get that because, again, they go, oh, well, I'm following the Hawks because they make sure I stay up to date with everything I, everything I need. And I think, that's, you know, I think that's a bit of a missed opportunity because the fans are going and finding it anyway. But if you can be the source of, 
oh, we're getting that uh, getting that content. I think it's a it's it's a really valuable option. Yeah, and you know, and I agree with what you said. It, it, for some, I think they see it as counterintuitive, um, but I look at it very similar to uh, the sharing of highlights on social. Uh, this was a, a big to do uh, in the NBA. Uh, you know, we weren't allowed to do so for for a while. Um, because the concern was this would be cannibalizing the the rights holders or it would be detracting from people watching the games. Um, and I think almost to a man, the team felt like, no, this will help uh, your driving interest. And even if it's not, you know, owned by the property or whatever, or if fans are then sharing their own highlights or whatever, it all leads to attention. And And at the end of the day, like, that's what we want. We want people to be paying attention to our product. Uh, and honestly, by any means necessary. And you're right, we're not going to share something that's just totally, you know, killing the, the coaching staff or the organization. We're, we're going to keep it positive, but any kind of good story, you know, good publicity, we want to share because it helps to get people to continue to pay attention to us and, uh, you know, and keep their interest. Yeah, I had that discussion with Pete Holderman um, from ESPN around the around the access, uh, the digital rights, and and the fact that the NBA has sort of gone all in on you know share away fans, uh, and it's you know completely counter to other leagues that have sort of playing whack a mole with don't share our content, we're trying to protect our rights, all of that kind of thing. I'm definitely in the camp of let all the fans share because it it drives tuning, it drives deeper engagement, it drives people to watching more games. It's like I have to see this game because I've seen all these highlights. Um, I have to tune in or I've got to follow the game. It develops It develops everything that you're trying to develop with your whole social strategy, that fear of missing out. I must be at the game. I must be attending uh, That because you're seeing all these cool highlights. And it's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of years whether – whether the NBA way um, of just letting it be and letting the fans go or the, the try to shut it down way that other leagues are doing, which one's going to be the winner? At the moment, I'm definitely leaning towards the NBA because it's some, it just can't be stopped. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's very hard for, for all the networks to put to police um, and it's far easier to go down the way of let the fans share and show their fandom. Uh, I think it's, I mean, you're right. And, you know, at the end of the day, money costs. So that's going to play a huge role in it. But it, there is some bit to me of if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, and, and, I, and I said this to someone recently, and, and I believe this to be the case. The interest in the NBA, to me, in the last few years has exploded specifically because of the behavior of sort of, you know, what you call NBA Twitter. Uh, the point where I, I think it's almost the same way that fantasy football helped the explosion of football, you know, back in the 90s, and maybe before then, I don't know, I'm not a historian, but that has such a big place with why American football is so popular, and I think NBA Twitter plays a huge role in bringing new fans into the game, because it's just so fun when you're watching games to see the sports bar of the internet talking about it, and, and, and a big, big part of that is the sharing of Vine clips, so did you see this play, did you see that play? and commentary on that. It's a big part of the experience for the young fan. Yeah, you can only imagine that uh, uh, Dominic uh, Larry Bird battle if that happened in a, in the Vine Twitter era. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the NBA Twitter would have completely lit up uh, with that game. No question about it. Um, I wanted to touch on, uh, you know, you've been working in the N- NBA digital family uh, for you know, for a long time, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of NBA uh, NBA uh, based guests on the podcast, and I found it to be one of the most collaborative leagues uh, as far as teams and and all the digital um, execs know each other, and there, and there's is a really good collaborative space of, of of sharing. Do you want to talk a little bit about what it's like inside the NBA digital family? Yeah, it really is what you just said. It's a family, um, or at least that, that's certainly been my experience. Uh, we're all competitors. Uh, you know, everybody wants their, their digital to be the best and to be the first to market with, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, but at the same time, I think we all recognize that we're competitors on the court, but we're not competing for the same fans. Uh, you know, the Phoenix market is different than the Atlanta market, is different than the Houston market, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're all happy to, to help each other out and, and talk about, you know, this program works for us and here's why, or this vendor be wary of because of X. 
um, it, it, you know, I, coming back three years ago to this new position, you know, overseeing digital for the Hawks, like a lot of what I learned was really from my colleagues. Um, and so the success that we had to whatever extent, I think they all deserve some amount of credit for that because they were so willing, uh, to, to be, you know, resource. Um, and you know, I, I've only worked in the NBA, so I can't speak specifically to how it is in other leagues. And I know every league is set up differently. I mean, Major League Baseball is centrally housed with their websites. Teams really more just do kind of the social stuff. Um, but uh, I, I've found only positives from everybody sharing with each other. And, and again, at the end of the day, because you're not competing for the same fans, you know, you look at like the apps, you know, most, teams in most of the leagues, frankly, are on the Yinscan platform, and there is some bit of uniformity to the look and feel of those apps. But the truth is, like, if you're a basketball fan, you're not sitting there saying, well, who's got the best app? I'm going to go be a fan of that team. You're saying, I'm a, I'm a Suns fan, I'm going to get the Suns app. I'm a Warriors fan, I'm going to get the Warriors app. And that's really all there is to it. It's only sort of insiders like us who would probably have all the different teams' apps. Most fans just have the apps for the teams they follow and that, you know, you can extrapolate that to every area of the business. So it's, it's really been great. And guys like, you know, Jeremy in, uh, in, in Phoenix and, and Jeremy in Golden State and Kevin, who was with the Warriors and Facebook. Now, I mean, down the list, really, I can probably name every single person. Uh, it really is a wonderful group of people um, and they're all willing to help each other. And I think that rising tide sort of lifts all the boats. Yeah, um, and yeah, and I do know other people in other leagues, and yes, there is collaboration, but it is something that I guess is always something when I'm talking to NBA folk that uh, they do, they do whether knowingly or unknowingly, they do name drop uh, that that they are talking to other other teams and uh, what they're doing, and it's a really close knit group. Uh, uh, Kirsten Corio works at uh, NBA in the team marketing and business operations. Been a long time friend, and I'm going to chase her down to get her on the podcast. I think they do a really good job. <laughs> Uh, they do a really good job in getting the teams together and in that collaborative space. Um, and yeah, and I think it's just a, it's a really good way of, uh, of operating a league. And like you said, you're not competing for the same same team. And, and you can use you know a phrase I like to throw out on the podcast: uh, steal with pride. Right? You can you can hear oh, what the oh. Suns are doing, and you can go, "We're going to do that. We're going to twist it with an Atlanta Hawks flavor and roll it out." And you know, you should be able to go back and say, "Hey, it worked really well for us as well." By the way, we did this. Um, you know, because it's for, it's for your fans. Once you put your flavor on it, your brand, your brand values on it, it's a different it's a different promotion. Um, but hearing that someone did something in their app or did something in stadium or rolled something out on a particular social platform, then you know you can you can put your own twist on it. Yeah, uh, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, we all steal from each other and and do it shamelessly. Uh, but we do it, like you said, if it works in one market, let's take that kernel and make it our own. Uh, but there's no harm in, in sharing and collaborating. Uh, and again, I think it, it helps everybody. And one, you know, one thing that you said that I, I think is so true, if nothing else, it's great to have that network because you're, you're just bombarded by vendors who are, sell, who are selling you on something and they love to name drop the teams they're working with. It's great to know that I can pick up the phone at a moment's notice and call any one of the teams that they've just dropped and say, hey, are you guys really working with these, with these people or are you not? And get a real sense for, is this somebody that's worth my time to talk to? Yeah, yeah. I, I provide that uh, vendor gatekeeping service for a lot of my clients. They go, can you speak to Sports Geek first? And then we'll decide if you get the second interview. So, <laughs> um, yeah, be very careful if you're name dropping that you're working with people because you will be checked up on. Um, to finish up, uh, uh, before we finish up, so what are you, uh, what are you thinking? What's, what's your next steps post Pokes Hawks career? Um, what, what do you think you're going to do uh, looking forward to doing the, in the future? Yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoyed my time uh, in the league immensely. Um, but I think especially after the success we had in digital last year, it just kind of felt like, you know, what's ever going to be better than a, you know, a 60-win season, a 19-game winning streak? Uh, obviously, winning a title would be nice, but uh, unfortunately playing the same league as the Warriors. Um, and so, uh, I, I but I love what I've been doing, you know, sort of content creation and and helping people understand the importance of, of, of content marketing and how really, if you want to reach your, 
your consumers like that's that's how you're going to do it. So uh, that's kind of the area I'm, I'm looking to, to to continue in. Um, you know, trying to figure out if that's something I want to do for myself or if that's something I want to you know do for for a brand or a you know or an agency. That's the part I still got to get a little bit more right with. But uh, I, I'm I'm all in on uh, on the content marketing space, and you know I just want to. Want to keep uh, keep brainstorming and trying to come up with new and different ways to uh, to accomplish those things. No, oh, terrific. Well, if anyone wants uh, a bit of a, a content marketing brainstorming session uh, with Micah, we're, we're happy to offer it out via, via Sports Geek and connect you with some people. So, who knows? Maybe that's a, maybe that's an angle we can go down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to finish off with the Sports Geek uh, starting five. I've got five questions to wrap up the interview. Um, what was the first sports event you ever attended? First sporting event was uh, Mississippi State basketball. Uh, used, my uh, my grandparents had season tickets, and so my my dad and I used to go to games all the time um, when I was little. And uh, actually, even got to see the one year they were good in '96 when they made the Final Four. So that was a uh, it's a big part of my childhood, for sure. Uh, and uh, favorite food consumed at a sporting event? I'm a sucker for nachos. Uh, I I just I know they're terrible and they're almost always bad, but I cannot quit them. It's like Cinnabon at an airport. No, very very good. The first app that you open in the morning is. Well, since uh, since Google decided to get rid of Google Reader, uh, that was a bummer. But I use Newsblur as kind of my uh, content aggregator, so I love to just kind of open it up in the morning and, and kind of see what's what's going on in the world and in sports and in digital and politics, what, what have you. What was that? What was that app again? I missed News it. Newsblur. Newsblur. Okay. Yeah. Um, one I've been using recently that's sort of in the same space is uh, Nuzzle. Uh, Nuzzle's a great app in that uh, it curates you. It connects to your Twitter feed and your Facebook feed, and it tells you which articles your your network is sharing the most of. So it's it's really good in in saying this is the you know this is the hot article or this is what everyone's reading and clicking on. Um, so it's a bit more in that curation space than than pulling in all the uh, all the details. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, definitely check that out. Uh, one other one. Um, yeah, who should who who do you think the Sports Geek podcast listeners should follow? Whether it be a, a Twitter follow or a or a writer or a blog, uh, and why? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that she's probably already on people's radar uh, if they listen to this podcast. But I think Jessica Smith uh, yep. does such a great job with her social and sports blog. Uh, I, I love seeing the stuff that she puts together. Um, you know, she does a great job of kind of recapping what teams are doing in big moments uh, and how it can relate to, to other teams. So uh, good on her. She's doing a wonderful job with that. Yes. Uh, War Jess Eagle. Uh, that's her second nomination. So she gets one more. She'll definitely have to come on the podcast. Um, but, yeah, I'd uh, give her a follow if you want to keep up to date uh, with, you know, sports Twitter and what's happening on social. It's a, uh, it's a really good, good feed. Uh, and what's your social media platform MVP? Well, you know, I'm sure people will, will say Snapchat and others like that. But for me, it, my first love is still Twitter. That's still yep. the, the conversation piece uh, that, that I go to the most, uh, especially for big events. Um, I, and I just think people have so much fun uh, on, on that platform. And it's so, so much more widely distributed, at least at this point, than some of the others. So for me, it, it still starts with Twitter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Micah. Uh, you can send Micah a tweet at Micah Hart, M-I-C-A-H-H-A-R-T. Um, any, uh, anywhere else that people can find you, or is Twitter the best place to, to hit you up? Uh, Twitter's probably the best. I, I'm on you know the other platforms as well. I think I'm Micah Hart on all of them. I, may, I might be Micah B. Hart on Instagram, but, uh, but Twitter's probably my, my most preferred locale. Well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. And uh, um, Atlanta is still on my list so uh, of, of a city to drop into and, and catch up with people, um, with NBA Digital being there and, and obviously the, the Hawks and the Falcons. Um, hopefully we'll catch up uh, in real life soon. Yeah, we'd love to. Welcome anytime. All right. Cheers. 
Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. Thanks again to Micah Hart from the Atlanta Hawks. And you can send him a tweet at Micah Hart, M-I-C-A-H-H-A-R-T. Uh, send him a tweet, tell him you've listened to it, tell him your thoughts on what some of the things that he spoke about uh, in the interview. And as always, you can always send me a tweet at Sean Cullinan or at Sports Geek to tell me that you have listened to the episode or what you can do is actually share it on LinkedIn. Now that Twitter doesn't show me how many tweets are coming in, I do see them, but I, I don't get... Uh, Twitter no longer shows you how many tweets are being shared off a, a specific URL. Um, obviously, I can't check those stats anymore. But one, one thing I am seeing a lot more of is a lot more content being shared on LinkedIn and a lot more traffic coming back from LinkedIn. So for those of you who are sharing the podcast and, and the Sports Geek content on LinkedIn, I'm very much thankful for it. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, then I'm just not doing my job right. I uh, pride myself on linking with as many people in the sports business industry uh, as possible. If you're sending me a connection request, please just let me know uh, that you do listen to the podcast. Um, I'll always accept, but I always do like to know where those connections are coming from. So until next week, if you could leave a review on iTunes, that would be very much appreciated. Appreciated. But you can also just send me a send me a review, either via email, sean at sportsgeekhq. Dot com or even via the Snapchat. Sean Callanan is my na- handle on Snapchat or just send us just a regular old tweet. Um, until next week, my name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek and you've been listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Like the Sports Geek Podcast? Find us on facebook.com slash sportsgeek. Check out which teams work with SportsGeek at sportsgeekhq.com slash clients. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening to the SportsGeek Podcast.